in Ecuador, a small South American nation, a brewing conflict between two different worldviews continues despite a signed agreement. On one hand, the government and its need for income for mining projects, and on the other hand, indigenous farmers, students, and a large segment of the population rejects mining projects in favor of more sustainable practices. Back in June 2022, an anti-mining and indigenous strike paralyzed the nation for two weeks. The Grey Zone covered it in a three-part mini-documentary series. Now, in this new series, we visit two of the most representative towns of the Ecuadorian resistance and also spoke to some of the main indigenous leaders at a national level to try to understand the reasons for the conflict. Ecuador's conflict is important for the rest of the continent because it is a country with a very progressive constitution that has a right-wing government and it is supported by United States of America while also hosting a number of Chinese mining companies. The activists defending their lands as well as the indigenous movement have faced intelligence intrigues and massive repression. It is also one of the last countries that have not overexploited its natural resources, so it undergoes a lot of pressure from the market in both China and USA. A victory of the resistance here could mean hope for the planet's biosphere and for other resistant movements. We traveled to meet the activists in their own land, resisting the extractive policies of the Lasso administration. The time has come to take advantage of our oil to the last drop so it can serve the poorest, respecting the environment. Respetando el medio ambiente. Some of the details of such an agreement are yet to be negotiated, like defining what will be considered a riverhead which is particularly important since those areas are supposed to be protected from mining. Yet week after week, while the mining projects keep functioning, the negotiation tables were cancelled by the government, ramping up the mistrust towards President Guillermo Lasso. Finally, the first negotiation roundtable took place on September 6 and 7, putting farmers, indigenous, and secretaries of state face to face for the first time in a long time. As we had expected, the government was not willing to give a single bit of ground at the negotiation table with the social movements. Jose Cueva, a farmer from the Intag region and a member of the anti-mining movement, was at the negotiation table. He said the government did not listen to the petitions that more than a year ago, hundreds of representatives from more than 70 social organizations from all over the country put together and delivered to government delegates as a desperate call for help. So yeah, we were certain they would not listen to us. We know the bonds they share with the private mining companies and multilateral organizations like the IMF and World Bank. They have conditioned Ecuador's loans and preferred treatment to opening mining projects and other natural resources for exploitation. We received the logical and predictable answers we expected, in which they basically defended the legal security of the mining companies. To the government, only the companies deserve legal security, not the territories, the community, or nationalities. The nine demands presented by the anti-mining movement included a cease of all activities until an official audit of the existing concessions take place, a permit revocation for those companies that act outside the law, 
and for the government and its agents to ensure the fulfillment of many constitutional principles, including ensuring water and food security for the population. Additionally, our demands included the creation of exclusion zones, areas where no mining is allowed because those areas are highly sensitive, diverse ecosystems, fragile ecosystems, indigenous lands, areas of very high importance as far as water, archaeological zones, urban zones. In sum, areas where because of national security or even common sense should not be allowed to be exploited. One important agreement got signed by both parties. All new projects will be frozen until new and more precise rules are written and put into effect. Other issues will also continue to be discussed. Yet the two parties could not be any more different. Since its inception, the anti-mining movement has gravitated towards the indigenous movement. Indigenous leader Dario Isa, president of the Kitukara community, explains the similarities in their worldviews. Nature is Pachamama, which to us is everything. Without it, we would not exist. We are but an expression of it. It is the water, the river, the mountains. It is the land we are planting on. We not only plant food, but hope to end hunger worldwide. And aside from the mining conflict related to open ceiling mines, other forms of world depredation are deforestation, monoculture, and mega farms, which use as many chemicals as possible. To poison the earth is to poison human beings. While we see nature as an opportunity for sustainable food and living sources, the companies see nature as a source of continuous profit. They don't care about the mountains and the rivers, and they don't consider that when they blow up a mountain, it can contaminate down the river and the aquifers, creeks, and wetlands. The farmers will then get no water at all, and if they do get water, it will be contaminated with arsenic and heavy metals. The indigenous movement has been at the vanguard of Ecuador's class struggle. Ever since the first uprising in 1990, the movement and the government have signed agreements that more often than not have been broken by the government. Yet according to veteran sociologist Diego Iturralde, who specializes in indigenous matters, this back and forth relationship is getting more complicated with every uprising and consequently broken agreement. The relationship between the Conaye and the Ecuadorian government has always been more of a socio-cultural one, to put it that way. It had symbiotic aspects and such, so it has not been a war, but more of a maneuver in which each side gives and takes. The government makes promises, then breaks them. Then the indigenous have to press again. And Konaye's success is that with every strike, they pressure the government, negotiate, and win a little bit, so their positions advance every time, and that has made them successful. But that is coming to an end. The problem now is that it is a social movement. There is not only the indigenous, but everyone else who hitch their wagons to the cause the bus drivers, farmers from the coast, and a bunch of poor people you have now in the cities, with no job or any opportunities. They are now joining the strikes and the result is what we know as a class war. It is not a negotiation anymore and no longer a dialogue of social segments. What we have now is a confrontation. The violence, unleashed ultimately by both sides, has just escalated in each of the last strikes, 
Correa, Moreno, and Lasso have all repressed and faced violence as a response. Each and every time, the rest of the population got caught in the middle of either the violence or the economic crisis and social paralysis caused by the strike and the government's response to it. Los dos sectores tienen una crisis muy fuerte. I think both the government and the indigenous movements are undergoing a very profound crisis of growth, an ideological culture, etc. On the government side, there is no political parties, and there is a very large crisis in the political and democratic scenario. On the indigenous movement side, there are changes in leaders and generations. So, as a result, you now have a confrontation between two forces that are not capable or know how to process such confrontation. And it could end badly. It could end up in a return to authoritarianism, for example. If you think about it, despite the uprisings, since 1980, we have not had a military dictatorship. Desde el 80 para acá no ha provocado una dictadura. We travel to Limón in Danza, Zamora Chinchipe, in the southeast of the country, the heart of the jungle, to talk to Ángel Antip, one of the first leaders of the Shuar Arutan nationality. As one of the main indigenous leaders knows the conflict from the inside out. We have two different visions because we are a people that exist as nationalities. The other population is mestizo, the settler population. So we have different worldviews and different realities. We don't understand each other, and you know why? No nos entendemos entre las partes. It is because we believe we have to exist under the support of nature itself. Because nature is our ally, that provides us with life. That is why we care for it, and not only because it gives us life, and not just to us, but to everyone. That is what we care for, we care for life. In contrast, the Western world thinks in terms of capitalism, that is the confusion here. The mestizo world thinks that by accumulating goods, accumulating capital, they will be happy and live the best life. But it is not like that. We think differently than that. Those who respect nature and preserve the forest, the water, which is vital for life, will be the happiest. That is what we believe. That is why our fight is for life. Not to accumulate goods, but to fight for a good life for our future generations. But is it even possible to fund a government without metallic and oil mining? There are certainly examples to look at, like the Ecuadorian city of Loja, one with the highest level of literacy, which is celebrating three years free of mining. In the American continent, three countries have already banned open ceiling mining. In 2010, Costa Rica was the first one, sitting grave impacts on the environment. In 2018, El Salvador followed by banning any metal mining because it threatens the development and health of families. This year, on April 2022, Honduras banned open ceiling mines because it attempts against public health and limits access to water. We are in a state in which the government depends on mining companies, whether metallic mining or oil mining. It is estimated that in 45 years, oil wells will dry up, or metallic mining resources like gold, silver, and copper dry up. What are we going to do then? 
We don't have a rainforest. We don't have clean water to plant and harvest or wetlands to plant. What will we do then? In 40 years, the eternal glaciers, as they call them, millinery from mountains like Chimparozo and Cotopaxi will melt. Don't know if completely, but what will happen then? The government is not thinking about how to fund road maintenance then, roads in part built for the population, but also for industrial and commercial purposes so mining companies can move material to the ports. So what will happen then? What will happen with health care and education? After mining revenues are gone, more taxes? Well, they could do that now. There is no need to dilapidate the jungle, the rainforest, the Amazon, the coast, or the mountains to only then know what to do. I think it is important to understand the position of the indigenous movement since 1994. Kone, on its political project, has proposed communitarianism. Facing predatory capitalism, we are proposing communitarianism. Communitarianism takes care of nature not as something foreign, but as part of us. But what does the indigenous view of communitarianism entails? We ask Diego Iturralde. ¿Cuáles son las, los asuntos que se, los conceptos que se concaponen en este campo en que tú has estado trabajando? So which are the opposing concepts crashing? In this field, you have been working on, on the one hand, there is a concept of utilitarianism or proprietaryship in the minds of the government and mining companies as absolute ownership. While the indigenous nationalities, cultures, and peoples have a concept of territory as a space to reproduce their culture, to reproduce their lives not as proprietary, but as commutarianism, so those two concepts crash. The indigenous, we are talking about the Amazon. They never fenced their lands because they trusted the lands they occupied to hunt, fish, and gather. To have their little vegetable patches of yucca, bananas, and such, which didn't need to be fenced. Other families could pass by those territories, and there are cultural rules about it. In contrast, when you talk about farmers or ranchers, they cut the forest, burn some bushes, plant grass, make a fence, and put their animals in. There is a concept of accumulation of labor there and no one is supposed to pass by their lands. And if someone passes and cuts their fence, there is going to be a problem. So similarly, the mining company's mind is that they acquire that space as property, put a fence on, and no one is allowed in. Ecuador's unresolved social conflict is likely to continue, with two opposite views facing each other. And while the laws are theoretically on nature and on the commoner side, fueled by an ever-growing need for metals and oil, transnational mining companies are some of the largest in the world and have plenty of power to exert. In the following chapters of this series, the Grey Zone will travel to two of the most symbolic towns resisting mining projects, to meet their activists and listen to their voices. Stay tuned.